today is the program special, in a way, the informational bomb. It is called The Man and the Law with Alexey Pimanov. Right before the May holidays, the blasts exploded in Ukraine. So they got in there too. And I have already said that and will never fail to repeat. No fight with terrorism will eradicate the evil until 2030 world leaders get together and find the answer to a seemingly trivial question. Who is exploding these bombs and why? Bombs go off daily in many different countries, regardless of religions, and until the answer is found as to who is financing these, through which bank and which special services are behind them, all these terrorist organizations will continue to play a big game of geopolitics, trying to restrict each other's zone of influence. Believe me, leaders are quite capable of dealing with it together and, so to say, of slamming their fists on the table. But they are not going to do that. The major question is why. Before Ukraine there was Belarus, 15 people died in the metro, hundreds were wounded, there was the quick arrest of the criminals, investigation, trial and death penalty. Let's note, all this was done under the laws of Belarus, a sovereign and independent state. I was astonished by another fact in the story. The flowers that many people deposited at the embassy of Belarus in Moscow after the execution of the terrorists. Did these people not think at this moment that, if they executed, in fact burned the metro and killed people, the flowers were blasphemy in the highest degree? I understand that these people fell victims of informational war, but one should use one's own head after all. At that time we decided to approach the Belarus authorities and request all materials of this high-profile case. We got the information, it seems, for the first time. Watch and make your own conclusions. Eleventh of April 2011. The time is 17.55. There is a usual stampede at the Minsk metro station. It's rush hour. Some people are going home from their work where relatives and loved ones are waiting. Some are hurrying to pick up their children from kindergarten. And some are looking forward to their first date. Octavius can blast on platform too. Too much smoke, we can't get out. See, these guys without legs. So young. Awful. Get down to the station, do you read me? Over. There are seven more people lying in metro, alive, we need more ambulances here. Ole, leave, go for the children, do you hear me? Girl, give me something for the heart attack. Here is a girl lying with her legs turned off. Tell the government to do something about it. Fifteen dead, more than 200 wounded, small Belarus froze in fear and terror. Who did this? Why? Law enforcement offices, combed streets and public places detained suspicious-looking people. Every inch of Oktyabrskaya station was examined. Experts scrutinized every fragment of CCTV camera footage. The effort brought results. Closer to the morning, the specialists pay attention to this seemingly unnoticeable figure. And less than two days after, the Minsk metro tragedy, the whole world knew the names of the terrorists, Dmitry Konovalov and Vladislav Kovalev. No, the suspects in this act were not members of criminal gang and underground organization. They were common Belarusians, aged 25, a factory worker and an electrician. They confessed as soon as they were questioned. On first they were arrested so quickly. They were so young that nobody believed they could have done this alone. Even their appearance, so different from images of cruel terrorists, generated many questions about whether or not they could really be guilty. Some people even thought that some of the evidence had been falsified. The media covers the story exhaustively. The principal defender, which is understandable, was the mother of them, Vlad Kovalev. Investigation? There is no evidence of my son's guilt. Against my son there is no evidence at all. 
but there is no evidence even against Konovalov. Understand? However, the court took the final decision, guilty, the sanction, death penalty. The sentence was executed in March 2012. The execution generated much media allegations that the people shot were in fact innocent. We decided to look into this high-profile case and determine who in fact set off the bomb in the Minsk metro and whether those who were guilty were the ones who were actually executed. Having noticed the suspicion person on the video taken by metro cameras, a wandering young man, the expert decided to trace his movement in the metro that day. The cameras caught him at 17.39 at Fruzinskaya station. It is him, entering the metro with a black bag in his hand, coming down the escalator, walking along the platform and entering the train. In three minutes the train arrives at Kupalovskaya station. The man gets off of the train and walks to the passage to Oktyabrska station. The back is heavy, so he stops, exhaled and moves on. And here he has reached his destination. Oktyabrska is the only Minsk metro station to have a transfer hub. There are always many people here, even now at 11 at night. On the day of the tragedy there were about 300 people there. Even in the large crowd you can't help but notice a young man with a sports bag in his hands. That is him, coming down to the platform. He stops by the second column, walks further on, then leaves his bag between fifth and sixth column and goes back to the passage. You can see him empty-handed. Now the countdown starts. The young man looks at the platform once more and apparently pushes the button. One gets a sense of how powerful the blast was by observing the carriage closest to the explosion. We were the first reporters to film the carriage. That is what was left of the metal carriage. What can be said about people sitting there? It wasn't just screws, nuts, balls, nails and metal balls, which were later recovered from bodies of the dead and injured. There was something else. The scattered fragments were like this. These are splinters of marble. While doctors were fighting for the lives of the injured, police officers found colored pictures of the suspect caught by CCTV cameras at the metro exit. That's him, on the square, moments after the blast. We are given to believe that about 7,000 copies of this photograph were printed in several hours. All of them were distributed to law enforcement offices. This picture played a major role in solving the case. While the search for the perpetrator was actively in progress, the alleged offender was drinking vodka in the company of friends, former classmates and a girl he had recently met on social network. It was later established that he didn't miss a single special news report on television that night, and apparently he was in high spirits. That is something a single witness, who spent three days in a flat with him, including the day of blast, stated. That is the exclusive extract. В том числе и день взрыва. Это эксклюзивный фрагмент. На кухне он сидел и пьял. А до этого? До этого не пьял. Не пьял ничего. А что он пьял именно? Я не скажу, что дурацкое что-то. Ну что-то знакомое или свое что-то он пьял? Свое, наверное, что-то. Сам придумал подобное. So little more than a day had passed since the terrorist attack. Meanwhile, the group of youngsters had spent their time drinking heavily. By the evening of 12th of April, there was no liquor left. The girl demanded to continue the party and declared, I want oranges. The young man decided to play gentleman and they both went to a shop. Unexpectedly, a police officer who had a copy of the terrorist photograph recognized him. The officer told the couple and reported the suspect's location to his colleagues. Dima. 
Обратите внимание на одежду задержанных. Have a look at the clothes of the suspect. Konovalov has the same jacket and hat which are depicted on the photograph of the presumed terrorist, which was distributed to police officers. Even the picture on the hat is clearly seen. The operational video of this detention was shown on Russian TV for the first time. Here is one of the most impressive moments. Is this really the young man who brought such sorrow and distress to hundreds of homes? The presumed terrorists were so heavily drunk, as clearly seen on the video, that they were not able to answer questions from investigators until the next morning. Пили. Мне очень можно пояснить, что вы пили. Что имеется в виду пил? Вот. Чуть позже, a little later, when he had recovered a little, Dmitry Konovalov started talking. Я приехал в Артминск. В большой спортивный сумке. Сумка находилась за мной устройство. В соседнем кабинете допрашивали... Other participants of the drinking party, Vlad Kovalev and Yana Pachitska, were interrogated in the next office. Although the girl had no idea what her drinking companions had to do with the blast in the metro, the boy seemed well aware. Moreover, he admitted that he assisted his friend in preparing the terrorist attack. He helped his friend in the terrorist attack. I know that Dmitry Konovalov is going to make a destruction Ковалев сразу же заявил о том, что Ковалев immediately stated that his friend Konovalov had set off bombs not only in the metro, but also during the 2008 Independence Day celebration in Minsk, where 59 people were injured. Moreover, he was allegedly responsible for the 2005 Vitebsk bombing, which resulted in dozens of casualties. Investigators immediately started to verify each word uttered by the suspects. We should clearly understand that in cases of such serious crime, it is simply not possible to believe at face value a statement made by Kovalev or Konovalov claiming responsibility. It was me. Further in our program, you'll see how Dmitry Konovalov had been preparing for the terrorist attack and the kind of components he used to make the metro bomb. Just a day before the tragedy, what were the young men doing hours before the blast? Yana seemed more interested in Konovalov than she did in Kovalev. Here are unique recordings of the investigative experiment in the Minsk metro. The examination of evidence given by Dmitry Konovalov and Vlad Kovalev, the presumed Minsk metro terrorists, began in their hometown Vitebsk. Dmitry Konovalov and Vlad Kovalev grew up in DSK, an industrial estate situated in suburbs of Vitebsk. They lived close to each other, one in house 6, the other in house 8. They studied together, chatted, played truant and took an interest in pyrotechnics. According to investigators, as the boy got older, they started experimenting in the building of bombs and also in getting them to explode. Of course, we wanted to learn what the parents of the major suspect, Dmitry Konovalov, thought about the case and went directly to their place. No, nobody asked us. But as we managed to establish, Dmitry's mother and father are not available for the media. In fact, they allegedly asked law enforcement agencies to protect them. Police officers are constantly present, close to the house. That is to avoid meeting people who don't fully understand the situation related to the blasts and the involvement of the persons. At the same time, during investigations, Konovalov's parents cooperated with authorities and shared stories about how difficult it was bringing up their son. He had not talked to his father for years. They recalled different minor details that were meaningful for the investigation. For instance, for instance, Konovalov's attempted suicides. 
Let's move forward in time a little. Konovalov's parents even didn't attend their son's court verdict announcement. I think they felt remorse and guilt for what their son has done. At some point, Dmitry Konovalov distanced himself from friends and relatives. Acute loneliness could have become the reason for his revenge on the world, for his own failure and uselessness. Who knows? Konovalov came from a dysfunctional, modest income family. Also, the neighborhood where he lived was not a wealthy one. So the only moment where he found inspiration, not even inspiration, but the only activity which seemed to motivate him was chemistry, pyrotechnics. Investigators, no doubt, examined the psychological portrait of Dmitry Konovalov. They got an image of him being an aggressive, egocentric young man. Ego is the center of the universe. Anything else? Yes, a mediocre crowd was not worth reckoning with. Perhaps this partially explains his bloodthirstiness. He developed his personality. It, just, it didn't just appear from nowhere. You can trace it by the kind of explosives he created. They grew from weak to very powerful over time. Konovalov and his friend Vlad Kovalev were interested in making firecrackers when they were 13. That is what their classmate Sergei Romansov told us. It's peculiar that his interview was recorded in the flat of Vlad Kovalev's mother, who invited former classmates to defend her son. Well, there were different interests. What exactly? Сергей tell her instead of me, I am afraid to say it to her. <laughs> what about it? Say as it is. What are you afraid of? Why should we be afraid? It's in the Vitebs bombing's criminal file. Common interests are at stake here. According to Romansov, it was Dima Konovalov who always lit up firecrackers, while he and Vlad Kovalev only ever watched. The device consisted of a long flask with a little magnesium, and there was a fuse. The fuse would burn and Zimka could also cut it and estimate the time of explosion. Well, he did that, and we knew it would blow up within four minutes. His friends confirmed that pyrotechnics became Dmitry's major passion for, it seems there was no place for anything else in his life. Add to this his family problems and, perhaps, some inner complexes. Even as a senior student, Konovalov tried to silence it with alcohol. <laughs> I miss you, my darling. But it seems that didn't help much, although another childhood friend called Sergei Baranok told her that he didn't believe in some hidden hatred that Mitya, which was Konovalov's neighborhood nickname, felt towards mankind. He would have shown it somehow anyway before. Aggression? Yes, something he had inside. For instance, when he made some explosive, he never put it in somebody's pocket. Investigators established that already at the age of 19 he started making a very powerful bomb and shared his far-reaching plans with Vlad. That is what Vlad indicated during the investigation. Dmitry Konovalov Потом как-то рассказал мне, что собирается сделать взрыв в центре города. Ковалев оценил оказанное доверие Коновалов. Ковалев appreciated Коновалов's trust in peculiar way. No, he didn't lock up his friend in the storeroom until he changed his mind. He didn't smack him to knock foolish ideas out of his head. On the contrary, Vlad offered him help and admitted to having some trotil. Что имеет некоторые запасы тротила. Военнослужащий войсковой части Жолудев. Soldier Zhelodov stole TNT in 2002 during his military service. He stole a large 400-gram TNT grenade and two smaller 75-gram ones. He stored the grenades at home. In 2005, he sold them to a miner called Kuzinok. 
Within a couple of days, Kuzinov had sold the TNT grenades to Kovalev. According to the investigation records, this purchase cost Kovalev 20,000 Belarusian rubles, which is 300 Russian rubles. When he learned of his friend's plan to set off a bomb in Vitek city center, Vlad immediately offered to buy the arsenal. Kovalev gave Konovalov the throttle and in just a couple of days learned about a bomb which went off at a Vitebsk city center bus stop. Two people were injured. Vlad realized straight away that this was Dmitry's work. He shared this during a subsequent interrogation. Осколки там, какие-то металлические части использовать. Вот. Ну, через некоторое время, ну, он стал этим заниматься, в общем. Ну, опять же, взрыв произошел возле кафе Ирида. Вот. Ну, уже пострадало много народу. Тогда в Витебске 54 человека получили... Осколки. That time in Vitebsk 54 people suffered injuries. We can only guess what Konovalov's reasons were to choose such a place to set off a bomb. The cafe was a place essentially frequented by college students who gathered in the evenings, relatively well-to-do young people with their interests and their active personal lives. Something that Konovalov, a technical school student from dysfunctional family and with few friends, didn't have. Some specific objects were recovered from the crime scene and from the, within the victim's bodies. The metallic legs of a Sevania lamp lock. This led investigators to explore the possible involvement of watchmakers or their family members in perpetrating this crime. In 2005, Vitebsk law enforcement agencies started investigating watch repair shops. Hard as it is to believe, police even visited Konovalov's home because his father is a watchmaker. Officers questioned his father and elder brother, but nobody paid any attention to the younger brother Dmitry. Neither did it occur to officers to go down the cellar, where it turned out he had a small laboratory and where he would do chemistry experiments. We are the first Russian reporters to enter this place. Konovalov used this place of the laboratory. Right here he assembled self-made explosive devices. Let's move forward in time a little and say that once the suspects had been detained and the place searched, police would discover flasks, syringes, chemicals, soldier iron, transistors, alarm clocks. They even came across an notebook with formula and diagrams illustrating the manufacture of explosives. Later, the cellar which connects all the blasts made by Konovalov and Kovalev from the bus stop in Vitebsk to the metro station in Minsk. All components and elements of the activated explosive device were found in his cellar. You can hardly call it laboratory. Well, in general, this place for him is quite enough. He worked here alone. Dmitry never let any outsider into the cellar, not even his parents, but his friend Vlad Kovalev was quite familiar with this place. Later, the expert would prove that. Biological traces of both Konovalov and Kovalev were found on the mask discovered in the cellar and submitted to us for examination. Some other boys from the neighborhood dropped into Dmitry's cellar to drink beer. Dmitry did not invite them inside the den. They always stayed outside, in the general area of the cellar, but a number of people would still catch sight of some things. Thank you.
By the way, there is one more interesting detail, which hadn't been accounted for up to now. According to the investigators, the cellar keys were found in Vlad's, not Dmitry's pocket, during the detention of both terrorists. The investigators believe that Konovalov handed over the keys to Kovalev so that he could be his success. But let us recollect the events that took place in 2005. Immediately after the visit by the detectives, Konovalov went to see Vlad to give him the rest of Trotin. The boys decided to hide it immediately. Later Kovalov revealed where they had built the hideout. Here are the shots taken during the investigative experiment. After a year, Vlad dug up the trotil at Dmitry's request. Then, once everything had come down after the explosions at the Vitebsk cafe and bus stop, he decided to continue this dirty walk. According to Vlad Kovalev, Konovalov also asked him if he wanted to watch the process of testing the explosive devices. He usually used one same testing ground for each test. Our film crew visited this place and even found bomb craters. He carried out his last test here in February 2011. Now we are at the very place where he carried out an explosion. And you can see a crater at the place where he ignited the blast. Konovalo filmed his experiments using cameras and mobile phones. Here are some filmed extracts of these tests. By the way, have a look at this extract and pay your attention to this silhouette and remember the gate of the man who sets off a bomb in the Minsk subway. There is much in common, isn't there? According to Konovalov's personal testimony, after the Vitebsk blast, he decided to move to the capital. During the nights of 3rd to 4th of July, there was a concert of Belarusian and Russian pop stars on the square near Stella Minsk Hero City. Nearly half a million people attended the festival. Dmitry Konovalov confessed that he was in the crowd that day with a bomb camouflaged in a Jew's bag. After that, he went to the apartment he had rented beforehand and collected the other bomb. Vlad Kovalev told the investigators about his friend's plan. For reasons unknown even to Konovalov, one of the bombs did not detonate. In addition, it was found by two men who, it must be said, are lucky to still be alive. First they kicked the juice pack, which was stuffed with trotil as they wanted to see if the pack was full or not. Then they decided to open it. The question is why they were not worried by the wires and switches they saw inside the pack. These men were in a festive mood. 
and they just wanted to find out what was going on. So they pressing the bombs which several times, but nothing happened. At last, the men decided to show the objects they had found to the police officers who were standing nearby. This was the unexploded bomb on which, in 2008, the police detected the fingerprints of the alleged terrorists. The fingerprints were not found on the outside of the juice pack, as some people may think, but on the inside of the actual explosive device. The fingerprints were left on the foil that covered the explosive, and on the tape that was used to wind the screws inside the explosive device. In the meantime, while the police officers examine the inside of the juice pack, the other bomb detonated at the festival place. As a result, 59 people were injured. The criminal case was initiated by a hooliganism article. Kovalev told the investigator that his friend was not satisfied with the way the article had qualified his act. Террористический акт. Был недоволен. Besides, he was disappointed that he had left his fingerprints. Everything went wrong. In addition, several days afterwards, the president announced that fingerprinting would be obligatory for all Belarusian men. Dmitry Konovalov, however, managed to escape having his fingerprints taken. Thus, during the army draft of 2009, he received an expert by telling him that he had been fingerprinted the day before. The expert took his word for it and issued the certificate which enabled Dmitry Konovalov to avoid the fingerprinting procedure. This certificate was placed in the personnel file of Conscript Konovalov, enabling him to leave for his military unit without undergoing the fingerprinting procedure. So for the next years, Konovalov was undetectable to law enforcement agencies. Later, this expert would be convicted for negligence and sentenced to the prison time. Meanwhile, Konovalov wasted no time during his military service. Before leaving the army, he stole three fire extinguishers. Each of them could be used as a bomb shell. They would all be found later, when his cellar was searched. They had labels with the index numbers corresponding to the fire extinguishers which were used in Konovalov's military unit. Upon leaving the army, Konovalov immediately met his friend Vlad Kovalov and told him about his intention to bomb the Minsk subway. However, according to the evidence given later by Kovalov, when Dmitry told him about his intention to bomb the subway, he didn't pay much attention. After the day of their meeting, they did not see each other for several months. Vlad moved to Minsk and Dmitry stayed in Vitebsk. But their next Next meeting was to be fatal. In the beginning of April 2011, Vitebsk police checked its fingerprints database. It appeared that the database did not contain the fingerprints of Dmitry Konovalov. They immediately called him to the police for fingerprinting. Konovalov obtained a medical sick leave certificate. But little did he know that on the 9th of April, police officers would come to his home and have him fingerprinted there. As soon as they left, he made a phone call to Kovalov, who was in Minsk. Ну, видимо, что все равно терять нечего. Ну, отпечаток пальцев на этой бомбе был, ну, которая не взорвалась тогда. Так что он решил, что нечего терять. Konovalov went down to the cellar and built the bomb. It did not take him much time and effort. Judging by the investigative experiments, all his motions were rehearsed to perfection. For example, it took Dmitry only 57 seconds to make this explosive device, whereas any layman asked to do the same thing would have taken significantly longer. I got the impression that he brightened up at the opportunity of building an explosive device, as if he got satisfaction from this task. Yes, and what's more, he was given an opportunity to perform a job he liked doing. During the experiment, Konovalov immediately gave detailed responses to all questions put to him by the expert. 
которой я отфильтровал и высушил вопрос вы после образования вы фильтровали просто через руки или как через ФБ тряпку как человек, который никогда не how could a man with no experience in dealing with explosives know how to filter this kind of substances and what to do with it? The experts' conclusion on the matter, including from Russian experts, was unambiguous. The bombs set off in the metro in 2011 and the bomb, which did not detonate at the Stella in 2008, were produced by one and the same craftsman, Dmitry Konovalov. There is no evidence that it may not have been him the perpetrator, nor that during an investigative experiment he changed his work habits in any way. In fact, almost everything was reproduced accurately. Konovalov assembled the bomb in his cellar and the next day he went to the Vitebsk railway station. Within a few hours, Dmitry was in Minsk. Here he is, walking along the platform. At the station he was met by Vlad Kovalev. Now you can see them both coming up the escalator. At this moment Vlad knows what is inside the bag. Вот двое парней. Here are the two boys carrying the same black bag, which would blow the metro the next day. Vlad bought the local ads newspaper to find somewhere for Dmitry to rent. It wasn't long before both of them were in a rented apartment. Dmitry decided immediately to take a reconnaissance trip to the metro station. Now you see the unique episode. Konovalov is studying the whole Oktyabrska metro station area. It was the day before the blast. He is looking around. The boys decided to spend the evening in the company of two girls. Dmitry recalled that through social media he had met a girl called Yana Pachitskaya, who lived in Minsk. He decided to call her. They agreed to meet at the Frunzinskaya metro station. Yana Pachitskaya came, accompanied by her girlfriend. Yana's girlfriend checked to be sure that no harm would come to the girl, the boys looked decent, and left. The three drank vodka all evening, then went to sleep. Although Yana preferred Dmitry Konovalov, she slept in the same bed as Vlad. You say that you got to know Dmitry through the Vkontakte website, and then you came to see him in bed, right? Yes. So why did you sleep with Vlad? In a bed? Yes. Them I don't know. I fell asleep. Did you have any sexual relations? No, we only watched TV. You didn't have sex with either Dmitry or Vlad? With neither of them. By the way, both the boys had relational difficulties with girls, particularly Konaval. <laughs> The investigators interviewed almost all the girls who had ever met Dmitry. Not one of them said that they had been in a sexual relationship with him. Could this be another possible motive for his aggression? This is only an assumption. In the morning of the 11th of April, Vlad left for work and returned only for lunch. The group continued drinking. Konovalov was drinking little. He said that he had some work to do. Kovalev was drinking a lot. About five o'clock in the evening, Yana noticed that her new friends had secluded themselves behind the curtain, which divided the room into halves. I opened the curtain from this side and saw that they were doing something in the bag. Where was the bag? It was here. Was it right here? Yes, and they were sitting. The boys immediately closed the bag and told her to go to the kitchen. It became obvious later that they had been putting the bomb into a state of operational readiness.
It is important to realize that Kovalev was an electrician. It was the electric circuit of the explosive device that was brought into action. We can only logically determine what Kovalev's role was in putting the explosive device into operation. So, Dmitry Konovalov left the rented apartment at about 5 o'clock in the evening. We have already shown you how he moved along Minsk metro, and now watch the unique extracts of the investigative experiment. This evidence search was carried out at night, when the metro was closed. Now Konovalov shows how he passed through the Frunzinskaya pay gate, and how he came down the escalator and entered the carriage. <laughs> Now the metro is working for Konovalov. He is still number one. Such a weird moment of glory for a narrow-minded, lonely, screwed-up boy called Dmitry Konovalov. Then he explained in details where he left the bag, how he walks up to the overpass between stations and how he chose a safe place for himself. Having examined the video recording of the investigative experiment, we chose the part which can be compared with the snapshot that was used by police officers to establish the location of the alleged terrorism immediately after the blast in the metro. Look, Konovalov has just come back to the rented apartment, but now without his bag. He switched on the TV straight away to watch breaking news about the Oktyabrska station blast. I was telling them that these guys were idiots, that it would have been better to bomb something else, but now why kill innocent children? Did you really say that to them? Yes. And what did they say? Why was everyone shocked? They were laughing. The next day the group continued drinking. They went to buy more vodka and some oranges. A passing police officer recognized Konovalov. The photograph of the wanted terrorist was in his pocket. They were then detained, whereupon they confessed responsibility for the blast. The evidence would be checked and confirmed in every detail. All the pieces of evidence would match. Fingerprints, components of the explosive devices, video. But all that was not enough for the mother to agree with the arguments of the investigation. Lubov Kovalova still doesn't believe that Vlad and his friend Dmitry perpetrated this unhuman terrorist attack. Investigation? There is no evidence of my son's guilt. Against my son there is no evidence at all. But there is no evidence even against Konovalov, understand? Lubov Kovalova considered that during the initial interrogation Konovalov hadn't been feeling sick because he had drunk too much the day before. Everybody could see it when we were shown the interrogation video recordings in court. Dmitry had been severely beaten. He could neither speak nor sit. The woman ensured that Dmitry and Vlad incriminated themselves and that during interrogations and investigative experiments they repeated texts they had learned by heart. He was mostly assembling the explosive device with strong prompting from the expert. His name is Kozares, as far as I remember. For example, he tells him, now you have taken this, Dmitry says, yes, I have taken this, and he starts doing it. In human terms, we can understand her. She is the mother, and she, I suppose, has the right not to believe. Though, during the court trial, Dmitry Konovalov repeatedly admitted to perpetrating the terrorist attack in 2008 and in the Minsk metro in 2011. The only thing he did not admit to was perpetrating the victim's bombings. He didn't want to confess to the victim's explosion because it was his hometown. He had friends there, and many people there knew him. In denying having committed the victim's crime, it was as if he was saying he didn't do anything bad to the people of his native town. But it is difficult to negate the fact. On the top of Konovalov's interrogation confession, there is also decisive evidence. Allow us to remind you about some of it. There were metal parts of the Sivani alarm clock contained in the bombs which exploded in Vitebsk in 2005. The same parts were detected later during the search of Konovalov's cellar. In addition, his fingerprint was found on the bomb which did not go off. The Interpol database contained the person fingerprints since 2008. They matched at once after last year's bombing. Well, it's hardly possible to believe that Interpol could place somebody's fingerprints in its database for money. Post factum, it's just impossible.
Consequently, having studied all the evidence, the court of Belarus found Dmitry Konovalov and Vlad Kovalev guilty of several bombings and sentenced them to the capital punishment. I could not understand at once how such young men could do it. I had a feeling that they had no parents or relatives as they committed it. I saw nothing human in their faces and eyes. Well, I don't know what to say. They are unpeople in my opinion. This is not a punishment for them. They will be simply killed. And how many people were crippled? And how many of them anguished as they were dying? The two men sentenced to execution appealed to Alexander Lukashenko, the president of Belarus for pardon. Alexander Lukashenko denied this appeal. I was in the metro in 40 minutes. I remember my people were preventing me from going there. They asked me, and what if there is another bomb? We cannot exclude the possibility. But it was impossible for me not to go there. I was actually there, I saw the scene. There's nothing personal there. And I experienced this. It is mine. I must bear this cross. And I will bear it with or without God's help. It concerns me. And it was my right to grant pardon or not. We tried to find people who could come down in favor of the accused person. We tried to find victims who believed that Konovalov and Kovalev were not guilty. Lyubov Kovalev says that there were people who believed that they were not guilty. Even the victims of these crimes said there, Oh my God, what are you doing? You are monsters. People were crying and screaming. We made telephone calls to more than 30 people who that evening were in the metro and then participated in the court trial. None of them had any doubts. It is simply a sacrilege in my mind. So all this story of this type, they are so young, they are only 25 years old, so how could it happen and why is their punishment so severe and so on? Do you condemn such opinion? Yes, I condemn them. I expect that all people who were in this hell condemn them too. The family of Roman Kaptyuk, who will never make the age of 22, like many other families of the victims of this terrorist acts, are still bemoaning their loved one. It was unbearable to see, just recently, just before his birthday on the 15th. I woke because she was crying in her sleep. She was crying, she was weeping, I must say. It was horrible to watch. And how could I go to sleep then? I woke because she was crying again. And that is why it is difficult for them to understand why on the day the terrorists were executed, some people in Moscow brought flowers to the Belarusian embassy in Russia. For Belarusian people it would be like, for example, someone bringing the portrait of Hitler to Hattin depositing in there and lighting candles. It would be a similar act. Speaking about a moratorium of the death penalty, the death penalty is still used in Belarus as a capital punishment. It may shock or disturb some people, but this is the law of the country. Neither the president, nor the court, nor the victims have any doubts that the true perpetrator of the terrorist act in the metro were punished. I wonder if those people who brought flowers to the Belarusian embassy are watching us now. Of course, you are fully in your right to not believe these images, to name our reporters devil incarnates and agents of Lukashenko. To such people I have just one request. Deliver arguments of the same power. On a final note, the legality of the death penalty is a different issue. That is all for today. It was the man and the law will meet next week.